Hello everyone and welcome to Young at Heart, session number 128. I'm Father James DeLucio with the Paulist Fathers in the parlor with air conditioning. If you hear a little rumbling in the background, it's the air conditioner, not my computer. <laughs> so I'm very happy to be here with you as I continue to share nursery rhymes, stories, songs, Mother Goose, Aesop's fables, and other things such as nonsense to keep us all young at heart. Today is a day I'm sharing more commentary and musings on the story of Beauty and the Beast, which we concluded in yesterday's session. Now, a few things more about background to be a little more specific than I have been in the past. Um, my copy here, also by the Opies, I've mentioned the Opies before, um, the Iona and Peter Opie, their collector of children's stories, the nursery rhymes, and things that's been their life uh, investigation and research, and uh, their professors of children's literature. Now, what they tell us is this, that the origin of Beauty and the Beast really goes back to ancient times, into Greek and Latin literature. Although it probably, like most things, if it's written down, it has, it's echoing things from long prior to that, often of a woman being married to or forced to marry to, uh, against her will or sometimes with her consent to animal-like men or men who are animals, <laughs> or just plain animals. Uh, there's things that can go back as far as the, uh, well, in the Greek texts, in the, before, right before or right after the Common Era, uh, there is a collection of uh, those stories in what is called the Golden Ass of Apuleius, second century in Latin, but it has many Greek antecedents and probably some Egyptian ones as well. What we know as the basic story of Beauty and the Beast, again, I will note there have been many variations, comes from a woman, and I think I may have mentioned her at the onset, who wrote a novel of 362 pages of the story, Le Con Marin. That was published in 1740, and the woman who should be acknowledged, as should all um, noted authors of whatever time or place, and her name was Madame Gabrielle Suzanne Barbeau de Galland de Villeneuve. Okay, now her story was condensed into a short story by another very literate woman, and her name was Madame la Prince de Beaumont, and she uh, had her version. Uh, let's see, if that came from 1740, then hers was printed in English in 1756 and again in 1761. But we find traces of the story going back to 1634 and even as early as 1550 in Italian. So, how interesting is that? I will now uh, Take to, oh, the other is the Greek and Roman antecedent happens to be the story of Cupid and Psyche. And you might know that one. Cupid um, tries to, courts Psyche, she, but he remains invisible. And she uh, trusts this spirit who speaks to her close to her heart. He sleeps next to her each night in physical form, but she can't look upon him. And then he disappears, noting that this... Uh, inferences of conjugal bliss is already that they're in a marriage. In this case, she cannot um, see her beloved, but at any rate, the story goes on uh, from there, which I might add, there are many versions of Beauty and the Beast that when the Beast asks her if she will marry him, it's not at dinner, but it is at nighttime uh, in her bed, and of course, in most of the stories that come from the Middle Ages and thereafter, it is a celibate chaste lying together in bed. Uh, of course, what would we expect from something that's already been colored by uh, uh, Christian sensibilities? But I imagine there are some that don't abide by such requirements. 
Now, I have two other versions that I'm familiar with, and I'd just like to point out some of the differences between them. The first is a very, very popular version published by another expert in children's literature, a Mr. Andrew Lang of England, and in 1889, he published his first of dozens, dozens of collections of fairy tales. In each collection, he assigned a color. So this was from the first collection called The Blue Fairy Book. You'll look him up. It's very interesting. Andrew Lang. There's a pink one and a green one and a purple one and a yellow orange, etc., etc. Now in his version, the merchant has six sons and six daughters. That's a lot of envious daughters. In all cases, the, the brothers are very sympathetic of beauty. In this, too, it's very interesting. The merchant, when he gets lost on the way from trying to recover a fortune that he loses because the lawyers grabbed all the money that he owed, um, he spends the first night in the woods in the midst of a big snowstorm in a, in a hollow tree. Now, hollow trees are also quite present in a lot of nursery rhymes, uh, nursery stories, fairy tales, and uh, there's something kind of magical and protective about a hollow tree. It's also a kind of down-to-earth reality, our relationship with the earth and with trees that protect us. It's the next day he happens upon the Beast's castle, and in this version, when he reaches the estate, it's suddenly, although winter everywhere else, it's suddenly spring, and there's a, made a big um, point of this kind of eternal spring uh, lingering at the castle, which is very different from uh, our sensibilities. In this, once Beauty arrives at the castle, she has a dream the very first night of a very handsome, uh, loving prince who speaks to her in the dream and promises to make amends to her for all the misfortune that she suffered by her sisters. So here, there's already a deep connection between um, a woman who suffers, uh, suffers because of callousness and jealousy, a, a, a desire to make things right. And it becomes the primary motive of this beast for reasons we don't fully know, but that adds another whole layer to the story. He then, in this dream, this prince says, Beauty, that he's trapped. Please search for him throughout the castle. He cannot say any more. He cannot reveal that he himself is the beast, but the dream is quite powerful. Now Beauty searches the castle, and here she finds a portrait of the prince that she's astounded. It's the same prince that she saw in the dream, but she believes that the prince is being held prisoner by the beast. So this colors her uh, reactions to the beast and her real a real tentativeness in giving him any uh, credit for these this kindnesses that he is initially bestowing upon her. In this version, every night the beast comes to have dinner with her, asking if she loves him and if she will marry him, and every night she refuses. She dreams of this prince every night since. Interesting that in the adjacent rooms to in, that beauty is assigned in the castle, one includes exotic singing birds that delight her and pantomimes probably in shadow, but not necessarily, um, are performed for her every evening. Um, and then the beast grants Beauty a visit with her family for two months. They are not a week, but all the sisters tire of her because the father and brothers urge her to stay beyond the two months. In this version, the sisters want her out back to the beast, but it's her father and brothers whose love for her restrains her and she stays longer than the time allotted. When she returns, in this case, um, she finds the beast about to die, but um, she weeps over him, agrees that she would uh, that she would marry him, she's come to love him, and he turns into the prince of her dreams. And then, miraculously, two women appear, an enchantress and the queen mother, the mother of the prince, thanking Beauty for releasing the man from this enchantment, evidently from some other wicked person uh, there, uh, implication by some evil spirits 
So there's not a sense in that version by Andrew Lang that the beast has done anything wrong, that this, that this reality wasn't his punishment. Nevertheless, he's redeemed by his magnanimity, kindness and love for beauty, and even his willingness to forgive her father. The other version that I'd like to share with you comes from the Italian version uh, in a book by Italian folk tales edited and retold by Italo Calvino, very popular New York Times bestseller list of these folk tales, translated by George Martin, released in the New York Pantheon book collection in 1980. Now in the Italian version, the, the Italian version, yes and no, you don't want to know. Of course, you want to know. Uh, the merchant has only three daughters, no sons. And he's lost in a snowstorm, and he finds shelter at the beast's castle. But here, everything is winter. Even the castle is um, covered in ice. When, when, oh, and by the way, here Beauty has a different name. It's Belinda. And the title of the story is Belinda and the Monster. In the castle, once Belinda arrives, the exchange is made between her father and she uh, is now, now there. Um, everything's labeled for her. This is Belinda's room. These are Belinda's clothes. This is Belinda's uh, pantry, etc., etc. And every night, as in the Andrew Lang version, the beast asks her to marry him every night. She refuses, although continually acknowledges his kindness and generosity. This goes on for three months, and then Belinda asks if she can attend the oldest sister's wedding, and the beast gives her leave to go. He gives her a magic ring that will transport her back and forth, but the wicked sisters, all three are wicked in this sense, they hide the ring on beauty, and she searches frantically, and she's more and more delayed, and um, of course, when she gets back, the beast is sick, not dying, but really deeply troubled. This repeats a second time with the second sister marries. The sisters uh, named here, the oldest is Osunta and the other Carolina. Um, and in this second time, it's her father that makes the girls give the ring back. This time he's almost at death's door though. A third visit home is not about the sisters, but their father is deathly ill. Belinda goes to help nurse him, and he does revive, mostly just for the joy and comfort of Belinda being with him. Um, then, this time, she loses the ring her, by herself on accident and searches frantically. When she finally does discover it, the gem on the ring has turned black as ebony with just the tiny, tiny, littlest bit of color on the edge. She knows this means this time the beast may truly be dying. When she arrives, she finds him where she had seen him in a dream, lying in the garden along a canal. And she finds him there and, of course, again weeps over him of all of his kindness to her and generosity and her tears um, and bring forth her pledge that she will marry him, whatever he may be. And he turns into a noble knight who's about to ascend the throne as king, and he makes beauty his queen. Now, also in this version, when this happens, a uh, the queen, not the queen mother, but the enchantress appears, and everyone's invited to the wedding of the king and of, of Belinda and the former beast, and when the sisters show up, the enchantress says that it's time for them to be punished, and she's turning them into statues so that they shall fall forever look upon this happy couple and stew in their envy and jealousy. She also offers a caveat that sometimes greed and um, selfishness can transform a person uh, at some point that, I mean, even with those sins, they can be transformed. But envy and jealousy and cruelty, she has very little hope for these sisters. So there we go with just two significant variations. And then, of course, you know of uh, the Disney version, which added the, the reality that the 
Prince is indeed punished for being selfish and unkind. And furthermore, um, there's a wonderful sense of when the two of them finally come to some common ground, and that is when Beauty, after a terrible, terrible temper tantrum on behalf of the beast, runs out of the castle only to be in danger of being devoured by wolves, and the beast comes to save her, and she in turn, uh, as he fights with the wolves, he's almost near death, and she saves him by bringing him back to the castle and nursing him. It's a wonderful, it's a wonderful dramatic device. I don't know if there were, if they found any written precedents to that particular aspect, but that's when things really begin to change. Uh, in there, up until then, he's really quite mean, impatient, intolerant, uh, and this generosity. Um, doesn't come from him, but in again the Disney version, it comes from all the attendants and all the servants in the castle who are very eager to make um, Beauty welcome, as you know. And there, they too have been punished by this enchantress because of the master's cruelty uh, towards them and others. They they just put up with it without holding him accountable. So when he's turned into a beast, these human beings are turned into inanimate objects, although they have um, energy and they're able to communicate and, and move around. Uh, so there's a real sense of the Piper being paid here in the Disney version of Beauty and the Beast. And then when the Beast is restored, so too are all the other characters. So there we have it, more things for you to ponder. If you were writing or just simply telling friends, children, anyone, the story of Beauty and the Beast in your own words, with your own imagination, what details might you add? What might you subtract? What basic theme would you use? Uh, as you could tell, there are various themes of reconciliation, forgiveness, punishment, atonement, um, what else do we have? Uh, um, despair on behalf of, say, the sisters. <laughs> no hope for them. <laughs> and promise and virtue. And let's face it, faith, hope, and love. Thank you so much for joining me today. I will return tomorrow with whatever the Holy Spirit may inspire me. And may that same spirit inspire you today to stay young at heart, safe, cautious, wearing your masks outdoors, and open to the graces and the blessings of God, which are here for us every day, whether we feel like it or not. <laughs> Have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me. You're part of my salvation through this pandemic, too. God bless. Bye.